Did you know when you look up at the night sky, you're looking at a bit of our Milky Way, a galaxy filled with over 100 billion stars. Our sun is just one of them. But did you know we only see 5% of the Milky Way? That is 95% of our Milky Way is made up of dark matter. And what is dark matter? Well, it's the stuff that neither absorbs, radiates or reflects any energy whatsoever. So that's why we call it dark. But how do we know it's there? Well, today, that's what we're going to discuss. And along the way, we're going to learn also about gravitational lensing. And I'm going to use these objects to help us get us there. Now, before we start, please remember to subscribe. And if you find this video particularly helpful, maybe buy me a cup of coffee and see the link in the description below. So let's get started. Now in 1933, Swedzicki was examining the Coma Galaxy Cluster, and in particular the velocities of how these galaxies are in that cluster. And due to the combined gravitational effect on each other, they move around similar way to a bees moving around some flowers. Now he used the Virial Theorem to establish the gravitational mass. Basically what it says is that there's a relationship between the total kinetic energy of a self-gravitational body filled with objects of similar mass, and in this case we're talking about the galaxies, to its total gravitational potential energy. And in that way, he was able to estimate the mass of the cluster. Now, the result surprised him. He got a value that was more than 400 times the mass determined by the luminosity alone. Now, he suggested that the majority of the mass was dunkle materie, or dark matter. It couldn't be seen, but its effect was there gravitationally. And in the following years, others examined other clusters and got similar results. But then in the 1970s, a number of scientists were studying the velocities of stars in arms of specific galaxies. It was the Australian scientist Ken Freeman, who in 1970 was one of the first to note that the speed of the stars in the outer reaches of the galaxy were traveling much faster than the Keplerian physics would suggest. And in the same year, Vera Rubin and Ken Ford also measured the velocities of the stars of the Andromeda galaxy, and they also noted that it didn't follow Kepler's laws. And during the course of the 1970s, more measurements were made of what we now call the rotational curves, culminating in a PhD paper by Bosma in 1978, which included not only optical measurements, but also the 21 centimeter radio emissions of hydrogen. In essence, this is looking at the spectral lines of hydrogen, but in the radio range of EMR. And he concluded, and I quote, perhaps a substantial fraction of the mass is not distributed in the disk at all. So I had an opportunity to speak to Ken Freeman about his work. So tell us a little bit about your work that you did in 1970 and how that gave us a better understanding of dark matter. The, the, the basic point is that we can use the, the rotation of galaxies to measure the, the strength of the gravitational field. And it's a very direct and very simple uh, thing. It's a real, it's a, it's, it's a high school exercise. We know that the material in galaxies, well, like the, the gas and the young stars, are, are going around very close to in circular motion. If you're going around in a circle, you need an acceleration inwards. There's the velocity squared divided by the radius. It's as simple as that. You measure the radius very simply from a, an, an image. And you can measure the velocity from either optical means or from using the hydrogen lines. You've got to realize that there is a problem with the, with the gravi gravitational field. You've got to <clears throat> measure the gravitational field at the quite a large distance. Because what I, th well, what I think some people knew at the time, and I think is, is why it's much more widely known now, in the spirals, the gravitational field is actually dominated by the stars out to, well, in our galaxy, for example, we have, we're well out towards the edge. And where we are, the gravitational field is still dominated by the stars. So if you want to really see that there's a problem, you've got to get a long way out. And to get a long way out, you've really got to measure hydrogen because that's the only, only thing that's out there. The, the, the stars and the, um, the ionized gas regions, they, they don't reach very far out. So the thing I did was to work out, you know, for some strange reasons that never been done before, was to work out what if the if the mass of a galaxy was distributed the way that the light is, how would the rotation change with radius? Now I don't know why that hadn't been done before. All the equipment was there really for almost a decade earlier, 
because the gene hadn't been done properly. And then I compared the rotation of different galaxies where you, you knew how the, what the light distribution was, so you could work out what the rotation, what the rotation field should be. Now I compared that rotation field with what we actually observed. And there was a problem that the data at that time for the hydrogen was really pretty poor. It was fairly clear to me anyway, including quite a number of other people, that there was a problem that the rotation that we expected and the rotation that we were actually seeing was were, were, were different. And particularly in the outer parts, we expect much less rotation. If, the, if all the gravity came from the stars, we expect much less rotation than what we were actually seeing. And so there was quite a, an argument until the data got better, which was in 1978, and that was with the work of Albert Bosman. He did his thesis using the, the Western Walk Telescope, and it was absolutely clear after he'd finished that the rotation of the galaxies really did stay right up. It wasn't until about the mid-'80s that basically everybody was convinced. But in that period, between about 1978 and the, the mid-'80s, the whole structure of the way we think about galaxy formation changed because suddenly it wasn't just baryons, the material that's made out of protons and neutrons. It was 20 times more stuff that we didn't know and still don't know what it is. So let's summarize. So if we examine the graph based on what is expected, you can see that there is a peak in velocity and then it drops off at a distance, particularly as the galaxy becomes more point-like and so follows Kepler's law. But what we get is this flat line, that the velocities actually stay high. There are two points that best explain this. There's much more mass in the galaxy than what we can measure simply by examining the stars. And the mass is not exponentially concentrated at the center of the galaxy. In fact, it's more spread out from the center. So from an understanding of classical physics, namely Newton's laws of gravitation, we actually have empirical evidence that our universe is actually filled with a significant amount of matter which we can't directly detect, but nonetheless it exerts a gravitational effect, and so this is called dark matter. But there's a second piece of evidence that strengthens the case for dark matter, and it comes out of Einstein's general theory of relativity. Now I'm not going to go into great details of the theory except to examine one key point. Light moves through space-time along straight lines. But objects with mass distort space-time. That means if the geometry of space-time is curved, this affects the trajectories of the light as well. So light continues to follow the straightest path possible through curved space-time. Let me explain it this way. So here is a very simple analogy to help us understand how masses can distort space-time and therefore make light bend, even though the light is actually traveling still in straight lines in space-time. So here's my board, that is my representation of space-time. And here I have some tape. This tape is not allowed to bend, and obviously if I place it on a straight surface, I'm going to get a nice straight line. But how can I put tape on there and bend, but not cause the tape to crinkle? Well, I need to distort it, and that way I do it with a base of a wine glass. So now what I do is I take some tape, and I run it across the glass, I'm running it over the distortion, the tape will not crinkle, but it changes path. And so the light bends according to us, but it is actually still traveling in a straight line according to the space-time. Now it was in fact this key prediction that the astronomer Arthur Eddington in 1919 used was to able to measure the shift of a star near the sun during the solar eclipse, the amount which was predicted by Einstein's theory. Now this brings us to gravitational lensing. Now, in 1936, Einstein suggested that stars could act like a gravitational lens. They may be able to see behind a star as the light bends around it. Now, it was Fred Zwicky, who also mentioned earlier, who in the following year wrote a letter to the editor of Physical Review, and he suggested that galaxies may be able to do the same thing, though he used the term nebula at the time. That galaxies, if they have enough mass, should be able to distort light coming around it acting like a gravitational lens. The issue, however, was the limitations of telescopy to resolve such data. So it wasn't until the 1970s that we had some photographic evidence that gravitational lensing actually occurs. Now, if the object was in a direct line of sight with the observation, you would see a ring of light. And if it's off-center, you would see an arc of light. 
Now I want to give you a quick demonstration of how gravitational lens works by using some simple tools. Now the first one I want to show you is again I'm going to use my base of my wine glass here and you'll see I have a light source down the bottom. I'm going to move the wine glass base across your field of view so you're seeing it from the top perspective. So in essence this represents my lensing body. My galaxy is distorting the light and obviously the amount of curvature in my glass is basically representative of the distortion of space-time and the glass of course represents the matter that distorts the space-time. So you'll see that as I move this across what you see of the light source will get distorted by the glass. Now if I move it in the right position you'll see eventually a ring forms. In other words, the light is bending around the body towards you, the observer, and you see this ring. And that has been seen in galactic imagery and is referred to as an Einstein ring. Now, if you're an educator, breaking wine glasses was probably not the cheapest way to demonstrate gravitational lensing. And so what I now have is a very simple demonstration that you can do in the classroom by simply making some jelly. Now this is not my idea, this is an idea that was developed by Magdalena Kirsting from the University of Oslo and Julia Werther from CERN and they wrote an article about demonstrating gravitational lensing and the evidence for dark matter and I encourage you to look up their article, I'll put the link in the description below. But in essence it's this, so I have basically a piece of card with a screen and I have a rectangular piece of gelatin that I place on the board here and then using a laser pointer you'll see that this is representing let's say my distant quasar, my light now will obviously refract and the screen will show a distorted image. Now the line of sight is coming out this way and so you see the object behind my gravitationally lensing body that I have here. And of course the gelatin represents the dark matter and of course the amount of bending is our distortion of space-time. One thing to note of course this is a very limited model and a limited analogy. In this case the distortion is caused by refraction. In the case of gravitational lensing the distortion is because of the distortion of space-time and the curvature of space which is causing the light to deviate from its path. I'm now going to do my similar demonstration that I did before from the top view but this time I've got a pyramidal piece of jelly that I've made and you'll see the same effect. Now in this case I've got flat surfaces uh, because it's easy to cut that way but if I place it in the right spot you'll hopefully see these bright spots around. This is familiar to what's referred to as Einstein's cross which is a distortion of a quasar that's sitting behind a galaxy. Now it's a little bit more complex than that. The lensing galaxy isn't homogeneous, that is the distribution of mass within it isn't even and so the lensing that it does will be somewhat distorted. And secondly, in many cases, the object that we're looking at that is behind the lensing galaxy will, will not be in the direct line of sight, it'll be off-center. And so therefore we won't see a nice ring, we will see some sort of distorted image that is pushed to one side or the other. So we might only see arcs of distortion. Now astronomers have detected numerous examples of these gravitational lensing and here are but a few. Now how does this provide empirical evidence for dark matter? If you can measure the redshift of both the light from the lensing galaxy that is distorting the light and the light from the distant galaxy that is being distorted, you can determine their respective velocities. And then using the hubble lemaitre law, you can determine their distances. If you then measure the radius of the distortion, astronomers can work out the angle of deflection and by that they can work out the mass of the nearby galaxy. And what did they discover? Again, they discovered that the masses of the galaxies that is causing the distortion is much greater than the mass determined by the starlight alone. Now one of the most compelling evidences has been the study of what they call the Buller Cluster. Now the Buller Cluster consists of two merging galaxy clusters and they are basically made up of the galaxies as well as a lot of hot gas and that makes up most of the ordinary matter. So in this image you can see the two galaxy clusters. The red represents basically the distribution of gas but if we then look at the gravitational effect the blue represents the distribution of the dark matter that exists within that cluster. 
And so we have concrete evidence that dark matter exists, both from a classical physics perspective and a modern physics perspective. Now I want to add, there's so much more evidence for dark matter than the two examples that I've just presented. And you can look up those things yourself. Now, what is dark matter? Well, we just don't know. Most physicists think dark matter is some sort of particle, a bit like electrons, but with strange properties, and they're actively looking for it. And there are some who think it may be non-baryonic, so for example, primordial black holes may be a good candidate. And then there's a small minority who wonder if the problem is that we don't understand gravity properly and we need to go beyond Einstein's general relativity. Now, whatever the answer, we're going to be learning a lot about our universe in the coming decades. So hopefully you've come away with a deeper understanding and maybe a greater sense of wonder about our universe. Please remember to like, share and subscribe. Hit that bell to get my latest updates and put a comment down below if you found this useful. And consider supporting me either regularly via Patreon or maybe a once-off payment via Buy Me A Coffee to help support the work I do. My name is Paul from Physics High. Till next time.